<laughs> Thanks be to God for those powerful words. Paul is always a very deep thinker, isn't he? Sometimes I get lost in those words, but I have to reread it, and once I reread it about maybe ten times, I sort of understand. So hopefully this message will offer a little clarity to you today. As we look at these words from Paul addressing uh, the church at Corinth, now you've got to remember the church at Corinth, these letters that Paul writes are letters to the church that have specific questions. I'd imagine that one of the questions that the church at Corinth had was, well, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? I don't know, I've wrestled with that question a couple of different times myself, but Anyway, it got me to thinking, um, and this is just totally unrelated to anything I'm going to say later, so just take it with a grain of salt. But is anybody on a diet here? One, one, two, okay, three. So I'm on this diet, and I got kind of freaked out because, well, during Thanksgiving, um, you know, I thought, well, I've got type 2 diabetes, but it's Thanksgiving, right? I will splurge on Thanksgiving because I don't get sweet potatoes and cranberry sauce and all the pumpkin pie with whipped cream. All that was those good things. So I got kind of freaked out because uh, Tammy says, well, did you check your blood sugar after that meal? And I knew it would be outrageous, but I didn't think it would be 583. So, I started to get concerned. I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, uh, you know, your blood sugar, that morning my blood sugar was 500. I think that night before I had a spaghetti, garlic bread, peanut butter sandwich at 2 a.m., and probably a couple of cookies. So anyway, he, the nurse calls me and like, you've got to get this under control, and they're freaking out, you know. So anyway, long story short, I've been on this diet, and I've been doing pretty good. You know, the willpower is good. I'm, I'm able now to at least walk past drooling, of course, walk past those dessert tables at the fellowship meals, right? It's like, and I see those commercials for like pizza late. Anyway, willpower can take you a, a long way. But there's a story about a man who was on a diet. And he was headed to work, and he passed by the donut shop. Now, through his willpower, he made it past the donut shop, but he kind of started turning in the direction back to the donut shop. And he was, no, no, I can't get donuts. No, no, no donuts. And so the man, finally, his willpower was wearing out. I mean, he was just beside himself. So he did what every, every one of us do when our willpower and all of our resources wear out and we can't have anything on our side. What do we usually do then? Huh? No, we pray first. You got to go through the whole thing, right, before you pray. I'm just teasing. First, you should pray first. But anyway, so the man prays, God, if it is your will, when I pass the donut shop, give me a sign. Give me a sign, God. I just need a sign that it's your will that I stop at the donut shop this morning and break my diet. If there's a parking spot right there, and in front of the donut shop, I'll take that as a sign, God, and I'll go. Anyway, so he gets to work, and his co-worker says, I thought you were on a diet. What did you do in bringing donuts? And he went through the whole thing about his willpower wearing out, and how he prayed, and what he prayed about, and he said, and you know what? God answered that prayer. Right there, in front of the donut shop, was an empty parking spot. It only took me eight times around the block to find it. You know, don't, don't, have you ever prayed for a sign? 
Have you ever been at a place where something was unclear? Maybe it was a decision or a relationship you're in or a job change or moving across the country or, or you're just struggling with something and you go, God, I need a sign. Give me a sign. Now, the Bible says we shouldn't really pray for signs, but nonetheless, sometimes we find ourselves in that predicament. And really, the reason the Bible says don't pray for signs is because in the time of Jesus and a little before, the Jewish Eastern peoples looked for signs of some sort to confirm that God was telling them something or doing something in the world or in their lives. Right, So, you can think about that. It's pretty obvious that that was the culture at the time because there was all kinds of signs and wonders in the Bible, aren't there? God does miraculous things. Like, you know, the wise men. They follow a star, a sign in the sky leading them to the Savior. Then you think about Moses, maybe, and God releases his people from Egyptian bondage. And he walks with them in a cloud uh, by day and a pillar of fire by night. And they're trapped on the Red Sea. And God provides a sign. What did he do? What did he do? He split the sea. you got to be tracking with me today, people. This is thick stuff. We haven't even got to the meat of it. Anyway, so he parts the Red Sea, gives them a sign. You read John's Gospel, the invitation to the disciples is, come and see. Andrew tells his brother, come and see about this man. And the whole thing is about, as John unwinds the Gospel of Jesus, it's about signs and wonders. I think sometimes we all want a sign. But then there's another kind of way of thinking about signs and confirmation about what God's doing or what God's done or how God's working in the world. And that is more of a Western kind of line of thinking. When I say the Western line of thinking, I'm thinking about the Greek philosophers. You know, there's logic and reason and philosophy and heated debates about why this happens and why that happens, right? And a whole philosophy that developed around people like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. We tend, of course, uh, when sometimes when we think about what God's doing, we make it a little logical, right? In other words, you know, we have a problem, so we expect God is going to do this, and then he'll do that, and then he'll do this, and then the problem will be solved. I don't know about you, but my experience with God is that sometimes God is very illogical. Or at least he doesn't meet my expectations or do things either on my timetable or the way I would do them. And we've had discussions about that, God and me, about how to do things. But it never works out. So anyway, the point is, um, or the question is, and the first question to you is, So how do you do it? Are you looking for signs? Or are you more logically minded, rational? Uh, It must be this way because of this and because that happened. And, you know, God must be doing this because of, you know, you see what I'm saying. Where, when you see God working in your life, what do you think of? Oh, it's a sign. Or do you think, oh, yeah, that makes sense. God's trying to get my thing. Maybe we do a little bit of both, but the debate goes on because why do people today have so much problem accepting God? God, I've run across people all the time, whether it's in meetings or on the street or maybe it's at the hospital, and they're always seeming to have this struggle with the faith. I wonder why that is. I I get kind of wrapped up around the axle trying to figure out exactly what it is that's holding them back from a relationship with God. I think there's a lot of different ways that we are held back or people get held back. I mean, some people are just, they're church hurt or they, uh, 
have had bad experiences in the past that, that cause question and doubt in their minds about who God is. And maybe they grew up and they just think God's mean and absent and mean-spirited. And they grew up that way. And so it, God isn't a very loving God. And if God really cares, you've heard the debate, right? If God really was a loving God, why does this happen? And why does that happen? And why, why is there injustice? And why is there exploitation of human beings? And why do people get addicted? And why is life unfair? And on and on and on. It's their image of who God is. The other kind of flip side to that, the false narrative about God, so to speak, is that you know, if you turn on the TV, you decided you're going to sleep in because you're tired of hearing Pastor Tom preach every Sunday. So you're going to turn in, tune in to, you know, one of the Joy Boys on Sunday morning. You know the Joy Boys, right? The Joy Boys are the guys that say, God wants to bless you. Or something along those lines. Or they just have that real big, suspicious, cheesy smile. God just wants to bless you this morning. Right? That prosperity gospel. And so when something, I always think that sets people up for failure. Because what happens when something bad happens? Well, God must hate me. I'm not rich. I don't drive a Mercedes. I don't live on the lake in a $1.5 million home. God must be mad at me. I must be doing something wrong. See, you know, our narrative about who God is makes all the difference. And then you add on to what Paul is saying today with this logic kind of thing as he addresses the church at Corinth. Highly steeped in Greek philosophy and the great thinking of the day. You know, we, we kind of get into that thinking in, a, in our own minds too, don't we? I mean... One of, the, one of my pet peeve Christian faith-based cliches is, you know, you'll be going and talking to somebody and they're going through a rough time and, and they'll say, well, everything happens for a reason, Pastor. Nope. I mean, it does. And as I've said to you before, just to warn you, it was probably your stupid decision that led to the consequences that you're facing right now God had nothing to do with it but you blame God for that decision right well everything must happen for a reason let me restate that nothing happens without God's knowledge and he's there to walk through it with you that's a way better way than to than to think reasonably and logically like well everything happens for a reason yeah it does but most, 99.9% .9 of the time, it was you, not God. So, but we still, you know, there's a cause and, ref and effect kind of thing that we kind of think about because of the reasoning. Because of the way we approach it from a scientific point of view or a logical point of view or a philosophical point of view. So we have to explain. In fact, our brains are made to do this, to connect dots. Sometimes the dots are connected, sometimes they aren't. But that's the way we think, that's the way we process information. So when we look at what God is doing in the world, we're trying to connect the dots. We're trying to think logically. Well, we know that God is in control of all things. We know that God established the laws of nature, that God established everything. So, I guess when we look at the difference between signs or logic and how we work out our faith with fear and trembling as the scriptures tell us to do, maybe we have to look at both sides of that coin. Maybe we have to be open to learning some new things about God. Maybe we have to let go of the control in the way we would do things so that God can do things in our lives that need done. No, as Christians, we preach something that is troublesome on both ends of the spectrum, right? The signs thing and the logic thing. And our friend Paul is trying to explain it to both groups of people. 
He's trying to address that signs and wonders theology and the logic, philosophical, scientific theology. And what he preaches is a simple message. He goes throughout the Roman world and tells about one thing. Did you catch what it was? Cross. That's all he preaches. The cross. He doesn't preach, prepare yourself for signs and wonders. He doesn't preach that God wants you to prosper and be happy and rich and famous and whatever else. Nope. He preaches one thing, the cross. And neither side, the, the people who desire signs, nor the, the people who are uh, looking for logical explanations of how God works in the world, neither side can get it, really. They're baffled by it. They don't understand it. And so the question is, what does it mean? What does a man dying on a cross, how does that offer salvation? Well, from a wisdom point of view, it doesn't make any sense, does it? And if the, if the cross were necessarily a, a sign that someone was searching out to confirm that God was doing something, it would seem like it didn't match up with a good sign. I mean, the disciples were discouraged and, and downtrodden when Jesus died on a cross. They didn't get it. So, how does a man dying on a cross offer us salvation? Well, you know, it's amazing how God works. I'm always amazed at how God works things out, what he does, how life always works out. But, you know, you think about it. The Roman government, for the cross, it was a sign of failure, shame, disrespect, uh, dishonorable defeat. The Romans wanted to send a message through crucifixion. But you think about that in contrast to Jesus' life. I mean, why would they do that? Why would the cross be so important? After all, Jesus preached a, a message of love and grace and peace. He told people, repent of your sins and have faith in God. He traveled throughout Galilee demonstrating God's love and healing and teaching and miracles. Pondered, sometimes I imagine, why God was being so rejected with this powerful message of love and grace and mercy. But he preached and he healed for three years. Some adopted his ways, some rejected. Jesus went before Herod, he demanded that sign, didn't he? Herod wanted a sign, Jesus didn't give him one. But the Roman government provided a sign, didn't it? The Roman government said, this man deserves to die, even though he was innocent. So Jesus died the life of a criminal. Sounds crazy to modern ears, doesn't it? Why put a man to death for doing nothing but sharing the love of God? Why such a horrible death, a humiliating death, a brutal death, reserved for people who we're trying to overthrow a government. Jesus was a man of peace. He told us to love our enemy. He told us that everybody was a part of the kingdom of God. And God loved them all. He showed God's love to everybody that he met. Then he willingly took on a cross. Turning point in history. A turning point in all of our lives. Offering salvation and forgiveness. Well, Paul goes through the Roman world, and this is the message he preaches about the power and the wisdom of the cross, and people are baffled. At what an odd philosophy. What a, a strange-sounding new teaching. I think that's the way people hear it today. Doesn't make sense. Foolishness. What do you tell people about Jesus when you meet them?
No, I, I'll tell you what. We did a whole year plus on evangelism and how to evangelize and how Jesus did evangelism. And we had groups and teachings and book studies and Bible studies and all kinds of things to encourage you to share Jesus Christ with people you meet. And we talked about it then, right? We talked about what you share. You don't share, hey man, Jesus can turn your life around and you'll win the lottery. Jesus didn't, didn't teach that and you shouldn't either. Jesus isn't just an add-on to life, he's a way of life. And really what we need to do is take away what Paul is telling us today. We need to t tell people about the cross. Christ crucified for us. Now, I know, probably not a real popular message today. But who amongst us, if you know you're doing things that aren't leading to a good life, want to really hear the truth? And one of the things that I struggle with is that the church has got away from that basic message of how God worked through Jesus on a cross to save us all. You know, we'll chase anything but Jesus on a cross. Don't we? I mean, there is a whole subculture, so to speak, that surrounds Christian believers. Don't believe me? How many book studies, Bible studies, other studies are there that you're, you can get in your hands to read about how to pray the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? How to increase your, increase your faith? Ten steps to a closer relationship with God. You can read a whole, there's a whole marketing slash profitable corporate and modern Christianity, isn't there? So, turn it off, talk radio when you get in your car after church. Just turn, it, turn the knob and you'll find a Christian radio station. I'm all the time as a pastor getting this or that information about how to develop strong leaders in your church. Ten traits of an effective leader. Hire this church consultant. We'll come into your church and we'll look at who your people are and what your community dynamics and demographics are. And we'll tell you what to do to grow the church. Folks, it ain't that hard. Keep it simple, stupid. If we just preach like Paul did, the cross, sure, it might offend somebody. It might, uh, you know, make someone uncomfortable. But Paul didn't care about that. Jesus didn't care about that. He laid it out and said, this is the way God's working. He worked through the cross so that you might be saved. He didn't worry about political correctness or woke ideology or political parties alignment. He just simply told the truth. That's what Jesus wants you to do. Tell the truth. You know, if, if churches aren't preaching that, telling non-believers this truth, it's no surprise that the church continues to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle and dwindle and die. Because we've strayed on what Paul and what Jesus Talked about and preached about. Jesus didn't. So let's take a moment. Why is it such a stumbling block then, the cross, to people uh, who don't believe in Jesus, who don't follow Jesus? This week, uh, well, let me go back. I'm going to talk about my brother Kurt. Because occasionally, between fights on the boat when he comes down to fish for a week, Occasionally, we don't just fight and argue about all the other things we... Oh, anyway. Sometimes we actually talk about Jesus. And he said an amazing thing to me one time about how uh, growing up, he remembers going into the church that we went to occasionally and seeing 
it was an old school Methodist church, big Court Street, United Methodist, the church to go to in town. And there was a big cross on the wall. And on that cross hung Jesus. My brother said, he walked in. He's just a little guy, so he doesn't understand anything. He walked in. He looked at Jesus hanging on the cross. And he said, man, if God is like that, I don't want nothing to do with it. Because if I step out of line, I may be hanging on a cross. Maybe a mind of a five or six year old, maybe that makes sense. And I've taken that to heart as I consider how I talk to people about the cross and how I approach people about the faith. But there was a second incident that I want to share with you. This week, um, my uncle... Uh, has been ill for probably like 15 years. He was battling a type of cancer, and I got a call last week that he's on hospice care. He's got a brain tumor. They're not expecting him to last more than a couple more days. So my cousin, who's the oldest of the grandkids, puts on Facebook the other day, I thought God was merciful. You know, I usually don't bite on stuff like that because it's just it's too deep to get into a Facebook debate about who God is and all that. I couldn't resist. She's a believer, but she was questioning, why, if God is so merciful, why is this happening to my dad? We've got those questions sometimes, don't we? Well, anyway... I think it's, you know, our expectations get in the way and we don't always understand God. Maybe we have that five and six year old theology of an angry, absent, wrathful, punishing, judgmental God. Or maybe we just haven't grown in our faith deep enough yet to understand that sometimes leaving this world and going on to, an, to the next is the mercy of God at work. I know you don't want to hear that necessarily, but maybe that's the way God's mercy is going to be revealed in this situation. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. They're going home to be with the Lord. All right. Well, it's paradoxical. I mean, think about what Jesus taught. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. In order to find your life, you have to lose your life. Think about the paradox of the Bible and how unexpected and curious God works. Sometimes confusingly how God works in the world. Paul reminds us that the ways of God might look foolish to us, but it's the wisdom and the power of God at work in our lives and in the world. That's how it works. Our ways are not God's ways. So... Let me just say, what's going to be the simple explanation you tell the believer about the foolishness of the cross? Well, you're going to tell them like we discovered in our evangelism thing, the nine words that sum up the gospel message in a nutshell. Anybody remember the nine words? God made it. It's two. We broke it. Number three. Jesus fixed it. God made it, we broke it, Jesus fixed it. The foolishness of the cross is God's plan once and for all to pay for the sins of the world. We couldn't do it with the law. We couldn't do it with a set of prophets. We couldn't do it on our own. The only way that sin could be dealt with is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on a cross. Now, maybe you're thinking like my brother, that brutal Roman way of executing people who they didn't agree with or thought were a threat or were criminals. And so you hang them on a cross, and it just seems like when I look at that cross, that's all I see. All I see is God's anger and wrath and judgment. All I see is pain and suffering and 
the torture of what Jesus must have went through that day. But let me just ask you today to see that cross in a different way because it's the cross that God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. The cross isn't a sign of death, it's a sign of life. There's a reason why Jesus isn't hanging on that cross. You know what it is? Because he ain't there. He's resurrected, he's alive, and he's at work in the world. The cross is not a message of hatred, intolerance, judgment, wrath, and anger. It's a sign of God's amazing, unconditional love for you. See, people don't always understand that. They ask the question, well, why does this happen? Or why is there violence? Or why is there corruption? Or why is there exploitation? Or why does this happen? It happens because of us. Our greed, our ambitions, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, our sin. And Jesus, once and for all, took on our debt and paid it in full so that we might be restored to the right relationship with God. Be made holy, not through anything we did, but through what Jesus Christ did for us. If you understand that, then it's not all about the wrath and the foolishness and the scandal of the cross. No, it's about God's amazing, unconditional love for you. He was willing to die for you. Isn't that worth living for? I think it is. I mean, I, I, I'm amazed. God, does, I told you, God does unexpected, crazy things in my life. And when I think I've got it figured out, God always throws a wrench into it all and lets me know who's in charge. But every time I've been in trouble, every time I've been down and out, every time I've struggled through life, every time I've faced difficulty, I know that there's still hope. I know that I can cry out and yell at God and say, where the heck are you? Why aren't you answering my prayers? If you're so powerful, why are you allowing this to happen? God's big enough to handle that all. And I'm smart enough to know I can do that because I know he loves me unconditional because of a cross and Jesus Christ and what he did for me. It's not that I'm abandoning my faith or being disrespectful or irrelevant or irreverent to get towards God. It's an honest cry of my relationship with God. I have faith in you, God. Why aren't you working? And he works in a foolish way and I go, well, I wasted my breath on that. No, we need to preach across the people who are lost, hurting, and in need. We don't need to try to make it more acceptable for folks. We don't have to follow the latest, greatest three steps to the evangelical growth of the church. We don't need any of that. What you need to do is get the boldness and the courage to proclaim God's love. God made it. He broke it. Jesus did. I hope that you'll take that invitation to heart. I've said it a lot that you know the church, our society, our world needs something. What we're what we're trying isn't working. It's not going to come from the next denominational program. It's not going to come from a church consultant who gives us the 10 easy steps to spiritual growth or church growth. It's not going to come from a political answer, a new law. It's not going to come from the ways in which the world thinks it's wise. It's going to come from the foolishness of God scandal of the cross, God's people being bold enough to stand up against evil. Stand up against injustice. Stand up so that people can be set free from the bondage of addiction. From the bondage of the past. From their misconceptions about God. That's how the world changes. 
one act of love. I hope that you'll join me. I hope that you and I will be partners in the kingdom to do just that. Lord, sometimes your ways seem so foolish. He told Neiman to go into the river and dip himself seven times to cure his leprosy, and he laughed and said, I ain't doing that. He told Abraham, Follow me, and I'll give you the descendants that are more numerous than the stars in the sky. It didn't seem to make sense. It did it. Jesus saw some fishermen on a shore and he said, just follow me. And they did. They dropped their net. Lord, help us to not get too full of ourselves and help us to be right-sized so that you can be God-sized. Show us your ways and give us your wisdom. Increase our trust and our faith in you that You don't have to worry and be in control of everything, that you've got it all under control, no matter how dark the circumstances and our situations seem. You always provide the ultimate answer, our greatest need. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he loved us enough. He put his will aside to do your will, and once and for all, paid. Christ for sin in this world. Gave us the opportunity for freedom and new life. Relationship. Thank you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.